let yourself have room to play. We are here in these bodies on this planet, ultimately, I think, to to to, to savor and to sample and to to connect deeply. And so just give your give yourself that permission. This is me giving you that permission and encouraging you to um to do some experimentation in your day. Maybe that's trying a new flavor of latte, or maybe that's asking someone out who you uh, have been thinking about for a long time, but not feeling brave enough to, to try it with. We, as far as I know, we only have this one short life, so get after it. Welcome to Normalizing Non-Monogamy, the podcast where we interview incredible people from across the entire spectrum of non-monogamy to hear their fascinating stories. We strive to bring guests on the show who have a healthy approach to non-monogamy. However, it's important to remember that everyone does it a little bit differently, and the views and opinions expressed by our guests do not necessarily reflect our own. Additionally, we produce this show for entertainment purposes only. Please be aware that we aren't doctors or therapists. Consult a medical professional for anything regarding your health that you might learn about on the show. Enjoy! Welcome to episode 282. We're Finn and Emma, and today we have an interview with Phoenix, who is a sexuality educator and peer-to-peer relationship counselor and coach. We cover a lot of ground, and you're not going to want to miss this one. Yeah, this is a super fun conversation, as Emma said. And I think one of the things that I loved about this is Phoenix has lived a lot of life. Yes. <laughs> and the experiences that they've had in non-monogamy and getting into it and BDSM and all of the things are so valuable and amazing. And they do a great job of talking through those and the lessons that come out of them. And so just a huge amount of gratitude to Phoenix for coming on, for sharing your story, and actually for being a part of our community. Phoenix is a part of our virtual community. Yes. Came to our our community retreat in January and is just out here in the Bay Area bouncing around doing awesome stuff. Yes. Links to all of their work, including signing up, how to sign up for the next body business meeting on April 25th, which Phoenix will talk about, are included in the show notes. Which you can find over at our website, normalizingnonmonogamy.com. Again, uh, links to their their like personal website, phoenixmandel.com, and, and all of the work can be found there as well. For anyone who's a premium subscriber, we're going to jump right into the interview now. And for anyone else, we got a few announcements. The first announcement is the premium subscription that Emma was just raving about. Raving is a <laughs> strong term for that. <laughs> you can find information on how to sign up on our homepage. Just scroll down to the bottom. That is a way that lets you pay a couple of bucks a month or a couple of bucks a year. You get to pick the price and you get to skip these fun, amazing, hilarious intros at the beginning. <laughs> I guess I should your, deli- your delayed laughter made it seem like uh, I'm, I'm going to leave that delay in. <laughs> I, I was delayed ra- laughter because I was feeling like I should really rave about this. Like the premium subscription is nice because you get to miss all this stuff. Yeah, but then you miss all this stuff. I, I know. It's a catch-22. So next up, amazing <laughs> things we're telling you about. We're going to be at Southwest Love Fest in Tucson, Arizona in just just a, like a week and a half from now. April 14th to the 16th. That's right. April 14th to the 16th, in case you don't listen that fast. <laughs> Sorry. I don't, I don't know how you talk. You should get a second job as the person who reads the disclaimer after like a car commercial. Super fast. Yeah, super fast. <laughs> so we're going to be, uh, again, Tucson, Arizona, Southwest Love Fest, April 14th to 16th. Emma and I, we're actually the opening the opening workshop. One of the opening workshops. There's a couple others. There's a couple others at the same time? Yes. How could they triple book us like that? <laughs> I know. But we are... <laughs> so it'll literally be you, listener, and us in the room together. <laughs> <laughs> One of the opening workshops. We're super excited. So our workshop's actually on Friday, April 14th. That's right. At 9.30 in the morning. And just a quick reminder that there is a virtual option to attend the conference as well. Just go to the website for Southwest Love Fest, which you can find links on our website, and you can find all the information. Information there. And while you're signing up, you can use the offer code Emma to save yourself about 10%. And it helps support us financially, which is amazing. Again, links to find all of that are in our show notes on normalizingnonmonogamy.com or in your podcast player below. Next up, we have to move our virtual meet and greet for this month. So the new date is going to be Saturday, April 29th. So still plenty of time to sign up. We would love to have you. These are open to anyone. You just must be open-minded and respectful. To sign up, go to our website, normalizingnonmonogamy.com, click on the events tab. And if you're not familiar with a meet and gre- or virtual meet and greets, they're a great way to come 
into a low pressure situation, meets lots of different people, and just hang out for a couple hours. I'd say you should go back like three weeks and listen to the intro with Kathy, who talks about how the virtual meet and greets were the gateway to her life opening up. She's now going to the YMCA, taking amazing classes. Pretty epic. Yeah. All that, all that for two hours. You get <laughs> two hours and pretty soon your life has changed. Yes. So we'd love to see you April 29th. April 29th. Turns out the virtual meet and greets are a bit of a gateway drug, Emma. Yes, they are. To? The, to our virtual community. <laughs> Which we already mentioned because Phoenix is part of the community, which is amazing. But we should quickly mention that you do not have to be a member of the community to join the virtual meet and greets. Although yeah. although you might, it might be like a side effect of joining the virtual meet and greet that you become a member of the community. Yes, that's true. <laughs> Anyway, you can join our community for as little as $5 a month. With that, you get access to an ongoing chat platform, plus monthly Q&As, plus men's groups and women's groups, and so much more. The group is amazing, if we do say so ourselves. And thank you, everyone who is part of it. We're so grateful. To sign up, go to our website, normalizingnonmonogamy.com, and click on the community button, and you'll find out all of the details there. Yeah, I was just going to echo some gratitude for everybody in the community. We're in there all day, every day. Maybe not all day, every day, but a lot of the day, every day. We have the intention of being in there all the time. But there are people <laughs> There are people in there all day, every day, supporting one another, sharing love. It's just amazing. So thank you to everybody who is a part of that and who has made it. Like my favorite place on the internet. Yes. Also, we wanted to throw out a quick reminder to check out our favorite way to get tested for STIs, which is Finn. STTest.com. <laughs> did, did I do it fast enough, Emma? <laughs> it took you a minute. <laughs> oh, I had to like, I had to really gear up for it. STDcheck.com. You can use the links on our website, normalizingnonmonogamy.com, to get $10 off your panel, which makes it only $129. And you support the show in the process. It's fast and simple, and we highly, highly recommend it. Yeah, this is the service Emma and I use to get tested. It's fast and simple are understatements. So check it out. You will not (laughs) regret it. Finally, we wanted to throw out a quick reminder for If you missed the episode last week, episode 281 with Roderick, we would highly encourage you to go back and listen. It's an incredible conversation, but we'd also encourage you to go and check out the film that Roderick is making. It is called Open, A Journey Through Love. There's a preview, links again in the show notes to go see it. And it also includes yours truly. Both of us are in the documentary. We're super excited about it. If I can't say that enough. Um... So go and check it out. I don't want to say we're the stars of the film. (laughs) But we're in it. So I won't. Because we're not the stars of the film. Humble brag. No, that's just facts. We're not the stars of the film. So I don't want to say it. Yeah. Anyway, love for you to go check it out. And with that, a quick reminder, you can reach out to us, send us an email, send us a voicemail. We'd love to hear from you. And now let's go talk to Phoenix. Welcome to the podcast, Phoenix. We're excited to chat today. How are you doing this morning? I'm doing great. I'm uh, a big fan of your show, and I'm very happy to be here to talk to all the other listeners. Yeah, we're glad you're here. Thanks for thanks for coming on. And maybe starting with just a, an introduction of, of who is Phoenix? Well, such a, such a short and simple question. <laughs> Le, I, I think the TLDR is that uh, Phoenix is obsessed with sex and relationships and intimacy and how to make those things better. And the way that shows up for me in the world is that I'm a sexuality educator and peer-to-peer counselor and coach. And I work with folks, particularly in the arenas of ethical non-monogamy, BDSM, LGBTQIA+, and sex positive community. Other stuff outside of that, but those are my, those are my passion projects, my specialty areas, uh, partly because those are all identities I hold and communities that I'm a member of, and partly because those communities are really, really underserved by the broader sex education, health education, mental health professional field generally. So trying to fill that need. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love it. Thank you for the introduction. We wanted to see, like, can you talk a little bit about what your relationship structure looks like at the moment? And then we're going to dive back in time a little bit. Sure. I am 
polyamorous. I'm polyamorous uh, by way of my relating style and also my relationship orientation. So I'm someone for whom polyamory is a is an orientation as well as a uh, way of doing relationships. Mm-hmm. I have been polyamorous for polyamorously identified for nearly 20 years now and have engaged in different flavors of ethical non-monogamy in that time, but primarily pro- polyamory. Currently, I am nesting with a partner who is um, who I have a soulmate connection to. I do believe in soulmates, but not a singular soulmate. <laughs> so we are we are a, a unique and special soulmate pairing, but not you not exclusively. And we're nesting in the fine city of Oakland, which I have recently moved to, and am uh, learning and exploring. I have a long distance lovership with a partner in San Diego. Uh, That is more on the casual, sporadic end of things. Somewhere between a comet and a satellite, I'd say. Uh, And my partner, my nesting partner and I are both dating. Though, uh, you know, in addition to the move and community building and et cetera, new jobs starting, there's a lot going on. But but we are technically dating. And uh, I, I actually had a very successful date last night. That felt... Um, like good proof of concept. I've, I've had some less successful dates in the Bay area and I wasn't sure if it was maybe that there were all these other life things going on, or maybe I'm just not the Bay area flavor, but I had a very successful date last night. And, uh, hopefully that is the opening of the floodgates. (laughs) Yay. Yay for successful dates. (laughs) I love that Bay area flavor. (laughs) package that and sell it i don't know what you put it i don't know what you put it on but <laughs> it brings a, a unique twist to i think you dish. put it into yeah. your uh kava or kombucha beverage <laughs> there you yeah, go. yeah 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 there you go i love it so so backing up two decades what what brought non-monogamy into your world so I was a freshman in college. I was very fortunate to discover these things on the on the earlier end because it's given me lots of different places to to play with it and and learn and grow. Even though I'm still quite young and lovely, um, <laughs> uh, I was a freshman in college and I went to visit a sex ed event put on by the student center at my at my sister's school. And the first part of the evening was this standard, uh, you know how to make college kids interested in sexual health conversations. And there's some SDI information, but there was also, uh, you could win this toy donated by a local sex shop by seeing who could put a condom on a banana the fastest with their mouth and things like that. And then the second portion of the evening and reflecting back on it, it's really shocking to me that they, that they allowed this on campus. In the second portion of the evening, there was a BDSM, lecture slash demonstration. I was sitting on the couch in the student lounge next to this woman and sort of chatting nervously, excitedly with her while the presentation was, was gearing up and talking about how I'd always been curious about this kink thing, but I didn't know anyone who did it. And I didn't want to go to a dungeon by myself. And, oh, wow, what would be really great is if I could meet a couple who was into BDSM because I'm sexually attracted to men, but I feel like another woman would really get me. At this point in my journey, mm-hmm. I was not, uh, I shockingly didn't know I was queer at that point. And I also shockingly uh, was was like, oh, of course I'm a cis woman. What other options are there? So now I'm in a very different identity place. But at the time it was like, yes, uh, fellow uh, friendly femme, let us let me talk about my dreams of a hetero couple that I can uh, <laughs> that I can join for kinky specifically for kinky purposes. Not even thinking really about the non monogamy aspect mm-hmm, of it. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And then you know, some time passes. The the person who's talking about the BDSM go, uh, is is winding up, and and she says, the presenter says, and now I'm going to have a couple people come up for a demonstration. S and R, please come up. And the woman I'd been talking to and a man on the other side of her who I had not in any way noticed or clued into the presence of mm-hmm. get up to do the presentation bit. <laughs> and I was so mortified. I was like, Oh my God, you idiot. You just went on and on about, uh, you know, finding some couple to show you the ropes and, and here they are the experienced persons. And I hope she didn't, I hope you didn't make her uncomfortable. Maybe you should just leave. And I ultimately like talked myself into staying because I was there with my sister. 
And I was curious about this thing. And where else was I going to encounter it in the universe? It felt like this was the moment. So after their presentation, they came over and were kind of like, so, I, you know, she introduced me to him. I was like, so I hear you're interested in such and such. And um, my sister came over to, to be introduced to talk to her. And the four of us were chatting. And we ended up talking so long that they kicked us out of the student lounge. They were like, hey, the, you got it. You need to leave. <laughs> yeah, this, is, this is done now. And they said, you know, we have a we live right near campus. If you wanted to keep talking over at our place. Uh, so how I, how I think about that now is, so I went home with them for extra credit and, uh, the, the, the weird, funny, like twist on it was that because I was there with my sister and it was her school, I wasn't even a student there. And she was enjoying talking to the femme partner in this dynamic. Um, we both went back. And so my sister and the femme partner went to one par- portion of the house far away and the mask partner and I went to another portion of the house far away. And I had my first ever, uh, BDSM scene and I, uh, immediate like subspace ecstasy saw God, like clearly this is the thing for me. Uh, and then I started dating that couple. And so my introduction to BDSM and ethical non-monogamy was this simultaneous pairing out of a, freshman year sex ed event at a school that I didn't even go to <laughs> that, that your sister like you went with two with your sister too yeah. like that she <laughs> like she was involved in that whole experience too <laughs> yeah 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 wow that's such a like uh incredible not, intro story I guess <laughs> not many people get to tell that first year college story so I love it. that's amazing and it was the gateway to so many things it was it was also where I learned about sex positive community and went to my first orgy and started to get more involved in Burning Man community and festival community and uh, started to do more exploration into my, in retrospect, very obvious queerness and uh, all of those kinds of things. So it really did, it really was a launch pad for all of this yummy exploration for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's amazing. And I'm, I'm curious... I mean, thinking back to when I was that age, 18, 19, to have two people sort of present this opportunity to me, I think would be like, would be super intimidating or, oh, yeah. or maybe I would be worried, like, am I being preyed on? Is there something like, what, what, what world is this that I just, <laughs> I sat down on a couch one minute and now I'm in a relationship with a couple, like maybe hours later, how how did you sort of sort through all of this as a 18, 19 year old freshman college student? Yeah, that's, I mean, that's a really great question. Uh, this, I, I think it helped that they were students at the same school. Um, you know, I, I we were freshmen and they were seniors, uh, but, uh-huh. but they did go to that school. And so there was kind of this like, oh, they're not total random strangers. They're just a sure. little bit strange and strangers. <laughs> um, and I'm someone that's a very, I have, I have strong appetites and I'm a very voracious learner and I tend to dive into the deep end of the pool when, when things interest me. And so that was very, um, oh, wow. Interesting topic that we share. Oh, now we're going home together. Oh, now there are, there are these parties or now there are these dungeons or now there are these other things was very aligned with how I tend to explore the universe. Mm -hmm. Um, where it got, where it got very difficult for me was that, that pairing, that relationship didn't, um, last very long. They were having some couples struggles around the intensity of the connection and, and my enthusiasm for all the things. And I'm sure, I'm sure it was somewhat challenging for her to have this 18 year old new to all of the things. Yes. To many, many things person (laughs) just kind of jump into the middle of their universe well, and, and let's be real, they're what, 22? Yeah, it's not yeah. Like, it's, it's not, not, it's not like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, they're so the wise. much older and more mature. <laughs> and I think, um, I think that their orientation up to that point, even though they were, I think, I think they were polyamorously identified. I think their orientation up to that point had been much more open, 
swingery, uh, secondary mm-hmm. stuff. A more casual. Uh, and that this was this was a new level of intensity and connection, and and it and it freaked them out. And mm-hmm. so, as as happens so often in this, it's it was one of those. Oh, we need to work on our relationship. Goodbye. And it was like, no, this this new universe of non monogamy and BDSM and sexy parties. What do you mean goodbye? Like, what am I supposed to do with that? And unfortunately, in my efforts to continue that exploration on my own, I did I did get preyed upon, and I did end up in some bad situations because I was. I was 18 years old and I didn't know any better. And I just wanted access to this universe or these universes. Yeah. Yeah. But it, it was very, it was a very exciting time and, and yeah, it was scary. And yeah, it was um, overwhelming. There were all of these other differentiating myself from my twin and my parents and finding my way in the universe, things that were also happening. Uh, But it, it was very easy for me to say, Oh, this is something I'm into. Yes, let us go all the way in. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, and I think that is, I mean, it's relatable for me of, of, of how I tend to do things. Whereas you, somebody opens a door or you open the door and you step into it and you start to see the, like that first thing is like layer one and what is below all of the layers and how vast is the universe. And, and even if stuff doesn't stick, it's sort of that throwing throwing spaghetti at the wall. Like, I don't know. Let's try this one. Let's try that one. Let's try this one. And what other way can I try it other than, or what other way can I learn rather other than trying and experiencing? And so I I can really relate to that sort of experimental approach to exploring. And and it does it does open you up for there's risk and there's potential for you to misstep or somebody to take advantage of that if you're mm-hmm. you're walking around with these yeah. like learning glasses on yeah and that's all you care about it's like well why would anybody pry on anybody like we're all doing amazing things and of course there's shitty people always lurking in the corners like well how can I bend this for my benefit even if it's not a conscientious like strategy yeah. I feel I do feel that some some folks it, it, it is and was, um, but yes, I, I agree with that. I think one of the tricky elements of existing in, in these more marginalized spaces or these more subculture alternative spaces, um, even though now today, you know, kink and, and ethical non-monogamy, et cetera, are much, much more mainstream is that the same social rules don't apply and that's mm-hmm. that's uh, that can be a wonderful thing in terms of open heartedness and exploration and self expression, but it can also be a really terrible thing in having fewer guardrails against abusive behavior. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and and so many people too. I think it's not necessarily nefarious. It's they're just playing. They're taking script from one area of life and trying to translate it to another mm-hmm. one where you're where you're all still learning everyone's still learning we're learning every day right we make faux pas here and there and everywhere and so it's not usually an intentional malicious thing it's a i don't know what else to do i'm just doing my best and i hurt somebody and i hurt somebody and i hurt somebody and you're learning at the same time and so there's a really i think a tricky balance of having grace and compassion and understanding but also being protective and caring and and a little bit guarded and it's Mm -hmm. a weird balance to find when you're also trying to like learn and open your world up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, Oh, you go. Sorry. Was they, so where did it go from there? Like that's after like that exploration in college and everything, what happened? Um, so I started hitting up the, the, the local dungeons and going to parties, uh, trying to find my new, Mm-hmm. Group, group to adventure with and I ended up in a relationship with someone who was very abusive and there were things there were things that you know were said and done in that context that now I'm like oh there was a red flag and there was a red flag and there was a red flag but at the time you know it was you know well real submissives would or well because I'm a dom I don't have to you know kind of kind of stuff and that dynamic was 
non-monogamous for him, but not for me. And it was not, I would not describe what that all was as ethical non-monogamy. I would not apply that (laughs) filter to it. Mm -hmm. Um, And there was somebody, somebody before that briefly who um, essentially used his membership to different private clubs and, and our age difference to mentor me. I mean, big, big air quotes (laughs) there. Mm -hmm. Um, and as, as, and essentially the arrangement was that he would get me into spaces that I would not ordinarily be allowed into. And in exchange for that, I was expected to, to perform in a certain way. Um, so I ended up in, so that was kind of the next most immediate thing was like, Oh no, not this poor baby Phoenix. Um, but I did, get to check out a lot of different spaces, many of which are no longer open uh, between the passage of time and the pandemic. There was just Mm -hmm. a lot of, a lot of loss of those spaces. And, you know, that's a real, that's both a real access issue and a real safety issue for folks. If there's, if there Mm -hmm. aren't, if there aren't public or like private membership, but still other human beings around spaces to go Mm -hmm. and, and explore and do these things. in, it, it, is very option limiting and, and can create dynamics that, it, uh, you, that, that needs some tending to, to not become. Yeah. You know, because there's not, <laughs> yeah. Cause those spaces, like those spaces are created to be a safe space to explore these things. And when, right. when, when they don't exist or when you don't have access to them, uh, you it, like the, that part of you that wants to explore these things doesn't go away. And so it, yeah. it, 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 cre- it can create some different dynamics that, um, yeah, like our can be a lot more uh, challenging. Well, I think you can wind up wanting to explore them. Maybe you end up in private exploring them with somebody who is exploring them with you in an, in an unhealthy and an abusive way, but it's, it's, it's hidden and it's private and there's nobody there to watch it and go, Oh, Hey Phoenix, that thing that just happened, that's fucked up and you should not experience something like that. Right. Yeah. There's, there's the element of, I don't know what I don't know. I don't know what's right and what's wrong. And I right, think right. that's true. You talked about some of those red flags that it's, it, it's, I think easy for somebody to come and be like, well, I don't know. My Dom said this and they're the Dom and I'm the sub. So obviously that's what we do. We do what the Dom wants. Right. And if there's no one there in the community to say, no, 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 that's not how this fucking works. Then you, you, you don't even know. Yeah. And I, I will say I, I love private parties. I, mm-hmm. ha- and there are many good, kind, ethical people who participate in this. It's just this portion of my journey yeah. was not full of those. <laughs> yeah. But, no, 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 for sure. But following sure. this, this, um, abusive relationship, I ended up in partnership with someone who um, would eventually become my master in a master slave dynamic. And um, eventually we got married and the entirety of our relationship was ethically non-monogamous from the beginning. It was like, we really, really love each other. We also have lots and lots of love to give and um, all of these places we want to explore. And some of our kinks aren't necessarily aligned and we still want to be able to meet those etc. So that that was the start I think of of a more self-actualized non-monogamous journey and I I think I I really resonated with polyamory as distinct from other kinds of ethical non-monogamy at that time and and started leaning more into that. And we had a variety of partners together and separately over the years. At, a, at its largest configuration, we had a, a poly family that involved five cohabitating adults um, and two other outside the house partners. And uh, the level of relationship management conversations that had to happen in a day was much too much, much, much too much. It also really complicates things like breakups because when I was fed up of one of the male partners in that dynamic being a shitty boyfriend. And I did not want to be in partnership with him anymore. I was able to break up with him, but I still had to share 
my house and my bed and my partners with him. Uh, and if you think it's tricky to see an ex around the office or around the campus, <laughs> let me tell you, seeing an ex on the other side of your freaking bed is a very challenged experience. Um, <laughs> or, yeah, yeah. Or, or yeah. hearing them in the next room over with somebody else. Right, right. That's yeah, my girlfriend, yeah. and I don't mind sharing her, but Jesus, dude, come on. <laughs> Yeah, um, I, I, <laughs> that could, not yes. a house big enough. Yes, for me. that's very challenging. <laughs> very, very challenging. Yeah, I do miss the bed that I had in those days because we had this. We called it Bedtron, and it was basically it was a California king and a queen bed squished up together to yeah. like c- create this wall to wall situation, which was oh great for all of the people and all of the pets and etc. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Has a lot of uh positive things and also some not so great aspects when yeah. when things when things go sideways. The yeah. true the true definition of a bedroom. The, the entire room yeah. is a bed. It was exactly that. It was exactly that. <laughs> we need to get back to the roots of our words. Yeah, right. This room is the bedroom. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh my gosh. That dynamic sounds uh exhausting and also what an experience. An experience. Yeah. 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 It was. Like, it was. Yeah. I, I, I find that after much trial and error that my sort of resting com- comfortable amount of significant committed partners is three or less. Uh, so that doesn't mean that I can't have playmates and lover friends and more casual dating partners. But for people that I am, uh, that I speak to very regularly and that I make very regular plans with and that I might, you know, either consult with or have, you know, a tender communication about my future travel plans, for example, that number is, is much less than my capacity for, um, fun and adventure. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Totally. Totally. And I think too, it's, it's an important thing to note that, that not all relationships are created equal, right? There can be there's the, I'm living with these people and sharing a bed. And there's the, I see this person once a month and we don't even text between them. Perhaps, you know, we it's maybe it's a monthly booty call, so to speak, right? Like there's a wide range of how we can relate. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Sure. So I'm curious then how do you, I don't know, excise yourself from, from a, a, a communal living situation, a communal bedding situation to, like what, what are the next steps for you? Like that's, you're deep in it at that point. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, the, the, the real, real answer is major life crisis. <laughs> my, uh, my now ex-husband works in the, the weed and pipe industry, um, and had a bit of a criminal <laughs> approach to various areas of life. <laughs> Uh, you know, anarchist, mm-hmm. uh, I, I, I'm Mis- misaligned to, values, misaligned values, misaligned values. It's really, int- it's really, in- I'm a very politically engaged and involved person. Presently, I like, don't want to date people who don't vote in every election and thinking about myself married to this, um, anarchist glass blower, criminal type uh it's it's wild it's wild the twists and turns that that life takes um but ba- essentially there was there was there was a, an in an, an incident that resulted in us being homeless and it was very stressful it was a horrible horrible time and the pressure and strain of that moment sort of uh ended some of those partnerships and then it was, then we were just a triad, uh, living in this two bedroom condo with so many animals. I mean, we had, we had a dog, we had three cats, we had a snake, we had a parrot, like <laughs> it was a lot. Um, and so that series of crises sort of sp- by nature of imploding the relation, the larger relationship simplified things a bit. Uh, and then at some point my ex-husband determined that the thing that would be best for his career and for the family, et cetera, was for us to move to Oregon, um, under somewhat shady circumstances. And, uh, 
he and our girlfriend at the time moved up in advance of me and I was left to like, you know, be the, be the grown up that wrapped up all of the things in LA. There was a, there was definitely a period of feeling like a, like a single mother of teenagers, which is never how you want to feel about your partners. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. and another series of crisis events later, uh, it was actually on the drive with a friend up to Oregon, I had this horrible, horrible argument, uh, with my ex-husband on the drive up there. And I had this epiphany moment. I mean, literally my, my little Fiat is just crammed full of stuff, making the drive up, had this epiphany moment that, um, that we weren't going to make it. And that, that separation was, was really necessary. You know, meanwhile, here I go (laughs) with with my things. Mm -hmm. Um, and that was, that was when I started trying to, claw my way out of that uh and it took it took quite a while but uh but i did it i made it out and um moved back down to los angeles and uh was seen someone at the time who i would later and not that much later marry uh she i was adamant i was never gonna get married again but there were reasons there were reasons that made sense at the time. Mm-hmm. So we got married and we got a house and we got a couple of cats and we, you know, built this whole life together in Los Angeles. She and I are now in the process of getting a divorce. Um, and I really mean it. I'm really not getting married again ever, ever, never, ever. Uh, and that's very that's very painful and and tricky uh but it did create the space for me to break from LA more in a direction that I wanted to go you know the move to Oregon was in support of my ex-husband's career um other moves that I tried to make were related to caretaking of family and other obligations this is the first move that I was like okay I've been here. I've been here for a very long time. There are a number of complex relationships here that I want to give some breathing room. Where else do I want to be? And I wanted to stay in California because I think it's the best state there is. And I ha- have a fondness for the Bay Area, even though I don't know it very well. And my now nesting partner is from the East Bay. And so mm-hmm. it just seemed like, well, of the California spots, I might end up. There was some. There was some call to San Diego. There was some call to the Bay, and uh, by virtue of, and I know San Diego is gonna, you know, no shade to you, San Diego, but by virtue <laughs> of uh, both my soulmate presence here, and I think some more access to beautiful nature here than exists there. Uh, East Bay won out, and now I'm a uh, now I'm a proud news denizen of the East Bay. <laughs> <laughs> love it love it yeah wow what a what a journey <laughs> yeah um i'm glad you're here and thank and, you, thank you. And, and and finding your way here and doing like it sounds like this move was you know kind of something like something for you transformational yeah yeah Yeah. and so well like it doesn't erase all of the painful things that are also happening or have happened it's like it's you're making sounds like you're making, you know, making more decisions for yourself. And yeah. um, that's, that's really good. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. And really, really challenging. Yeah, it is. It is. And it's, it's also, um, and I don't know if you experience this from the podcaster side, but as, it, as a relationship and intimacy professional, anytime anything goes sideways in one of my relationships, there's this extra weight and baggage on it. And this pressure of like, you solve this problem for other people all the time. What's going on here that you can't solve it for yourself? And it's, it's, um, one, it's very tricky to therapize yourself, but two, uh, relationships involve more than just yourself. And, uh, sometimes there's not similar investment in, in sorting it out. Yeah. So trying to practice grace with myself around that. Oh yeah. Self-compassion for sure. Especially when you're like, I'm giving this advice to other people and working through other people. And it's like, why can't I listen to my own self? (laughs) Right. Right. Well, I think too, so much of it is experiential and 
learning as you go. I mean, yes, you can read, you can read the ethical slot opening up polysecure. You could read polysecure 400 times and that's not going to fix attachment wounds you have. Right. right. You can read about them all day long. There, there's an action to, component like, for sure. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. And so I think maybe that's sort of the, the, the next question that came to mind for me was what are the ways, and again, knowing that you kind of came into this it, it, you know, 18, which I mean, hell, we're still kids, Ben. And I like to still think of myself as a kid, but anyway, <laughs> you are, you're a big kid <laughs> fan. <laughs> I agree. I agree in the most loving way possible, but the, this journey that you've been on, what have you learned about yourself in ways that like, maybe you've grown through this challenging, but also beautiful journey? Um, I, I, I am in a, you know, an ongoing process of, of learning and, and integration. But the first one that comes to mind for me, that's, that's really a huge one for me. Uh, and that I encounter a lot in my work with clients is the idea that my value is not in what I do for other people or how I caretake other people or how I'm sexy for other people or, you know, those outward, those outward facing components. I do, I do believe that that each of us have an a moral, ethical, spiritual responsibility to to endeavor to show up well in the world and to show up kindly and to leave a positive impact. But the thing that that gives us our humanity and our innate value or the thing that makes us lovable is not what we do for people. And as someone who was raised in a very people pleasing, caretaking, you know, self-sacrificing version of love, that's huge for me. Uh, And it's really made a difference in terms of my ability to set and maintain healthy boundaries, (laughs) for example, (laughs) or the Mm -hmm. things that I'll say yes to. Um, And I'm catching myself. It's not that I don't fall into over giving or, um, engaging in relationships that aren't reciprocal, but I'm catching myself faster and faster in that. And I'm really committed to having reciprocal relationships. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, that is a huge, right. I think the ability to, I would say the ability to hold boundaries because what I've noticed for myself is I can set them all day long, but I can't hold them. Right. And I think that is really tied to the self sort of the self-worth that, because if I, there's this feeling of, if I say no, that means I didn't do something for somebody. And now I am somehow valued less because my value is tied to doing that thing that I just said no to doing rather than my value is if I said yes to that, I would have to give up some of who I am and some of that's where my value is. And so actually saying no is honoring myself and it's it's hard to do if you don't if you're not there and not that you can ever be there it's yeah. like i feel like some days you're there and some days you're so far away from it you can't even remember what it was like to feel that way and it's just such it's an ongoing process it's really yeah. an ongoing process and, a, and an ongoing practice something i find helpful around boundaries is this concept that boundaries are the distance at which i can love you so thinking about boundaries as as creating the conditions for for success in like shared fun and yumminess and juiciness and sustainability um because so often when we when we let people smash through our boundaries or we let them slide or we don't reinforce them because we don't want to make a big deal or whatever the thing is it's related to you know, kind of what you pointed out of like, well, maybe then they won't love us or then they won't stick around or then we won't be able to X, Y, and Z. But similar to the put your own oxygen mask on first, if you're not, if you're not maintaining your own individual personhood, then there's no, there's no future there. There's no movement through a space that results in all of these things that you're, that you're planning for. And someone who can't, honor your boundaries or can't be with communication around boundaries is not someone you're going to be able to have those things with anyway. So that idea of, Oh, these are, these are creating, this is creating the container. These boundaries are creating the container for all of these other ways of relating and things I want to do is often a helpful, like 
check back in with touch point for me. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 And I think in some ways for me, the recognition, right, is you say yes to everything because you think that's what people want. Pretty soon you can't say yes to anything because all of your bandwidth is gone. And, and so you think, well, I'll just say yes to everything. Yeah. Until you can't say yes to anything. It's right. sort of the, the pattern mm-hmm. that I've maybe uh, stepped in myself on occasion. Emma? Both of us. Both of us. <laughs> The great thing about recognizing those patterns, though, is like once you see them, that makes it more possible to break them. Yeah. Yeah. Possible yet not easy. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) But more possible than without recognizing them. It helps to create community around yourself Mm -hmm. that is in that conversation and to utilize the skills of professionals and whatnot for that kind of thing. Um, I'm also a big fan of journaling, not that I do it with any consistency, but I believe (laughs) in it as a, as a practice. Um, I think another thing about boundary setting is thinking about what I, what I want to hold in, in people's yeses and nos to me. And if I, you know, I would be absolutely beside myself if someone said yes to something with me that they didn't actually want to do. And then had, had, was negatively impacted by that. And so why would I put someone else in that position by saying yes to something that I don't really want to do? And that's another framing that's helpful for me in, in maintaining my yeses and nos. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I love that reframe a little different perspective. I'm curious too, how in like you, the work that you do and also in your relationships, like how open with you in your life with people and your family and friend circles, are you about non-monogamy, about relationships, about all of that? Uh, so I'm, I'm out pretty much everywhere. Uh, there used to be some professional places where I wasn't. Um, and I might not always lead with that in the conversation, but it's a huge part of who I am, how I exist in the world, how I operate, what my thinking about things is. Mm-hmm. Um, I also am an activist and I don't, I want to challenge people's assumptions about monogamy and by being visibly non-monogamous or by working it casually into conversation so that it's not this big deal coming out every time, but more like, Oh, blah, 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 this, Oh, that thing about your partner. Cool. Are the two of you monogamous? Are you, you know, what, what are you doing over there? And not assuming monogamy is, is something that I, that's very important to me to put out into the world and to practice. I'm unfortunately estranged from my bio family partly related to non-monogamy, partly related to my queerness and gender queerness, some other dynamics going on there. But I was out to um, all of my immediate family and my grandparents. And my maternal grandparents, uh, who passed in 2016, uh, were actually very supportive. Uh, As of his, you know, 90th birthday, my grandfather really made a stand for both of my partners at the time to be able to be there and to be able to celebrate with the family. And it was really special. He was, he was a very, very special man. And um, I was just telling the story of coming out to them about being polyamorous to, uh, to someone the other day and remembering my grandmother, you know, really trying to make it, make it soft and open and gentle and friendly and saying to my grandmother, like, I want you to feel comfortable, really any questions you have thinking they would, you know, intending for those to be questions about polyamory. And the very first question she had for me was (laughs) we're sitting in like one of their favorite cafes in the Marina in, in, uh, Marina del Rey. And she says to me, how, how do two women have sex? (laughs) She asked me that, not my sister who had been an out lesbian for years. That was, that was her first question about non-monogamy to me. And I was like, well, I've just said, you can ask me anything and I'll answer (laughs) shit. (laughs) (laughs) And that's how I explained, uh, sex between Volvo owners to my grandmother in a little cafe. (laughs) <laughs> but it got you an invite to the 90th birthday party with your partner. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, it's so, true. It's true. It, yeah. That was that was some time later. But but yeah. you're right. And it, you yeah. know, at the at the end of the conversation, 
you know, she was in her 70s at the time. It was very, I was very proud of her. Um, she said to me, I think if your grandfather ever asked for that, I'd cut off his balls, but I'm glad you're happy. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. I, radical honesty there, right? Yeah. <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah. I, I would I would love to hear too, Phoenix. At what point did your sort of exp- exploration of your queerness, gender queerness, mm-hmm. all of these things come into play? And as I mean, you touched on like early on, you had no clue, and mm-hmm. and somewhere along the way, I imagine it was a pretty big realization. Yeah, it's funny. They both both of those epiphanies deep dives happened in a similar way, which uh, showed up in terms of bisexuality and queerness pretty, pretty close to this ethical non-monogamy BDSM discovery point. Mm -hmm. Uh, I was having a a deep dive conversation with someone about sex and relationships as is my, as is my want. Mm -hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. And they were talking about their own bisexuality. And I, ca- I kept having the moment of like, that's not bisexual. That's how I feel. Oh, <laughs> and that was really, that was really where that stemmed from. And the gender queerness came many years later and really ha- had me feel like a very late bloomer, even though I was in my early, early thirties at the time. Um, not so late blooming, but still, you know, it's like, oh, how did I not know this thing about myself? And my my soon to be ex wife is is non binary and was talking about her experience of her non binary identity and sort of the ways that she conceptualizes gender. And I kept having that same tingling feeling underneath of like, well, but that's not that's not what non binary is. That's how I feel about my gender. Jo- oh no. <laughs> Um, and that happened around the time that I was getting divorced from my ex-husband and moving back to LA and that there was all of this, you know, my grandparents had just passed and there's all of this familial stuff going on. And I had just started dating this gold star lesbian woman. Um, and for years and years and years, I would, was telling, you know, everybody like, I really need my next girlfriend to be a lesbian, my my previous female partners at the time were my female partners at the time were definitely more hetero flexible than than genuinely deeply queer and i was just like i'm ready to go to the other extreme and so i'm dating this uh gold star lesbian and it, you know some i definitely have some feelings about gold star lesbianism but well that's another conversation and- and for, really quick, for anybody who's not familiar, a gold star lesbian is a lesbian who has never been with a man, correct? Yeah, who's, who's never been tainted by the touch of penis, basically, yeah. is, the, is the approach there. <laughs> um, and there's a lot of b- biphobia generally in the lesbian community related to this idea that that somehow uh, a cock alters your alters your being in some in some negative way. Certainly. Uh, opportunities to date for polyamorous queer femmes who are involved with men uh, within that community are very low. Very, very, very low. (laughs) Um, And that's not the only community that's true of, but it is certainly a limiting factor for femmes who love other femmes. Mm -hmm. Um, for fear of contagiousness, right? Like, yeah. is it like well, if I was exposed to COVID and then I could right, be exposed? Right. Yeah, I gotcha. I gotcha. Like, <laughs> is this catching? Is it gross? I, I've I've heard I heard a, a lesbian say in a bar once that she doesn't sleep with bisexual women because their pussy tastes weird. So it's that level of intensity about like an uncleanness or a wrongness or a, something like that. And it's, it's very sex negative and problematic and it's and it is also understandable as a reaction to heterosexism cis sexism patriarchy etc but it sucks it sucks and it's unhealthy and negative for everybody um we didn't we didn't get here on accident but it doesn't mean it's it doesn't mean it's any less fucked up and sex negative and hurtful to people yes exactly um and 
I just couldn't get over. She was never mean to me about it, but I couldn't get over the conversations that we would have about my gender and my gender queerness, um, not feeling like they, like they saw me or had room for me. Mm -hmm. And so we didn't date for very long. And it was like, Phoenix, you finally found your lesbian. Now your gender is a problem. Come on. (laughs) But, but it, you know, that's what it was at the time. And, uh, it's interesting to think about this expansive universe in which I'm engaged in and open to all of these different identity, you know, fluid and open identity vectors. You know, there's my, my gender queerness is a fluid gender identity. My, uh, my bisexuality slash queerness is a, is a poly sexual orientation, um, versus the monosexual, like lesbian or gay or heterosexual, um, would be monosexual orientation examples. And, I'm polyamorous and you'd think I'd have just like all of the options, but by virtue of not being vanilla or not being uh, by still, because I still love cis men and you know, all of these things, it's like, there's this shrinking effect of the, what the available pool is. I sometimes hear people say, Oh, I wish I were bisexual. Then I would have so many more options. It's like, maybe it depends. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, It depends. I appreciate that. The dive into that because it's, yeah, I think for everybody, again, having not gone through this, but my perception would be that the journey is different for everybody and how, how you come to it, how you move through it, where you land on the quote unquote other side of it. If, if it ever stops being a journey, right. Is, is so different for everybody. And so I appreciate the the look inside of it. So thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. And I, I will say, Specific to the ethical non-monogamy piece and bisexuality, there is a lot, there is this undercurrent of pressure to be bisexual for women and femmes broadly in that community. Mm -hmm. Um, And part of that comes from this like frequently applied couple centric straight man by woman lens that, that Mm -hmm. shows up in a lot of spaces and part of it is also this larger male dominated fantasy universe of like, well, why would you share your part? Why would you allow your partner to be with other people if it's not going to net you a threesome with two hot chicks, you know, kind of thing. So that's something that, that exists in non-monogamy community to be aware of in power dynamics and relationship orientations. And I also want to say that ethical non-monogamy can be a really valuable and affirming paradigm for folks who maybe came to their bisexuality or queerness later and haven't had exploratory Mm -hmm. opportunities, just like it's a valuable paradigm for folks who are asexual, who are partnered with allosexual people, or there, there are all of these different relationship configurations that would benefit from a little bit of opening up separately from the, all of the natural pluses and minuses of that orientation or relational style. There's ju- there are just specific dynamics that it's like, Hey, have you considered? Mm-hmm. Uh, and even for folks who are, who are more monogamish or just full on monogamous, there are a lot of practices and tools and tips from that are necessary in ethical non-monogamy And that can be borrowed from that community for monogamous folks to just have healthier, more um, emotionally attuned relationships. And so I always Mm -hmm. encourage folks, even if they're monogamous, to do the the mental exercise of considering how they might construct a non-monogamous relationship or what might be some of the appeals or opportunities of that. Because I think that's a very useful thought experiment. Mm-hmm. 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 Yeah, I love that. I love that point. And yeah, and I think that in and of itself, I mean, geez, we could have a two hour conversation just about that, right? I think the, yeah. <laughs> the idea that you could be monogamous and maybe just I'm just like hypotheticals, right? You're monogamous, but you have an agreement where you can have sexy flirt texts with people right. because y- your your partner doesn't want to do that. And that's a thing that like sort of fuels you. And in and maybe that's the only thing you need to just 
let that like energy go and show up and be the world's best whatever the world's best parent the world's best partner the mm-hmm. world's best whatever and flirting is fun and pleasure is good for you you sure, know i think we sure. i think we build up a lot i i've worked with people who um feel like it's cheating for their partner to watch pornography this is a there's there's some emotional disconnect around you know what it means that we as human beings crave variety and crave and and desire in multiple directions simultaneously that we don't uh instantly become blind to other people just because we're deeply committed to one person um mm-hmm. you see that a lot in in challenges folks have around their partners checking other people out or mm-hmm. you know like the flirting you mentioned and and all of it i think is sort outable within agreement but there's a lot of self work also that has to go into unlearning this like toxic jealousy culture that we exist within. Mm-hmm. 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 Yeah. Well, I think, in, and I think there's something in there right around gender being such a s- sort of a pinnacle of that quote unquote problem, right? Because if let's say every week I go out with my best guy friend and we have a beer, nobody, nobody's like, well, that's not strange. But if every week I went out with a woman and had a beer Everyone would be like, well, he's clearly dating her. They're, how can Emma... No, what does your partner okay? think? Why isn't yeah. she there? Right. And who knows? Maybe all we're doing is having a beer. But at the same time, with my best guy friend, what if what if we're flirting? What if we're secretly secretly developing a relationship? There's no, there's no security in any of it. It's just right. we're just moving through the world relating to people. And, and there's so many just stereotypes of this one's okay and this one's not literally the same exact activity yeah and Mm -hmm. one is okay and one is seen as a a nefarious act against our marriage Mm -hmm. and it's just crazy i think uh i I agree with that i think it's definitely a, a symptom of a sick society and i think another benefit of ethically non monogamous thinking even if you're not practicing that Mm -hmm is that it gives a lot of room for emotional intimacy across relationship types. I find within polyamorous community or other types of non-monogamous community, the level of emotional closeness and intimacy that I get to share with people who are just friends, there's no romantic or sexual dynamic, is much higher than folks from, you know, I'm going to call it Gen Pop, (laughs) who, who aren't engaged in those conversations. Um, because of the that those norms uh and that feels really really sad and isolating i think uh, i think a lot of our social problems come from touch hunger come from lack of emotional intimacy in our lives and when we pile that all onto one person first of all we're more complicated and nuanced than that and and no one person can meet all of our needs um and so if you're choosing to be monogamous which works great for some folks. It's a, it's about consciously constructing that in a way where you can maximize the needs getting met and where you can have a little wiggle room and flexibility around closeness with other people. When I see these articles about, is your spouse having an emotional affair? It makes me so nuts. (laughs) Um, Because while it's true that you want to have good communication and clarity with your partner or partners about the ways you're engaging with others, there is nothing inherently wrong (laughs) with having closeness with other people. And actually it's good for you. We as social animals require that (laughs) our nervous Mm -hmm. systems require that. Uh, So I encourage folks, what, wherever you are in this universe, even if you're like just dipping a toe into considering this thing and listening to this podcast and deciding it's not for you to expand your I encourage you to expand your thinking around how close relationships are about to be or how uh, are allowed to be or how physically affectionate relationships are allowed to be because we need touch and we need emotional intimacy. And one person, even if they're the most wonderful, perfect soulmate person in the universe, really cannot fill all of that for the entirety of our lives. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and uh, I think too, right in there is, the intimacy has to be tied to romance, sexuality, and all those things that you can't in the the let's call it the mononormative world, you can't just have a close, intimate friendship 
without it being like, well, they're intimate. They talk about their deep feelings. So they've got to, then they've got to bring in sex and then they've got to bring in some type of escalator to take you to some other level versus no, we just, we do this and we do it like this or, you know, on the flip side, even one that kind of like breaks people's brains is we're married. We have sex. We raise kids. We don't sleep in the same bed together. We have separate bedrooms or we have separate houses. And it's like, why not? If that's what you found works, then do what works. If, if everybody's happy, other than all the people looking in from the outside going, well, that's weird. Like it, it yeah. works. Yeah. 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 Uh, okay. <laughs> off my, I'm off my soapbox. <laughs> <laughs> we would love for you to talk a little bit about the work that you do and and how people can find how you. people can find you. Yeah, great, thank you. I'm gonna actually bump back just slightly related yeah. to please, Finn, please Finn, do Finn's mention of a soapbox because I realize I did not define bisexual in this conversation, and that is that is one of my hills to die on every time. So bisexual, as we use the term today means attraction to one's own gender and other genders. Not necessarily all genders or regardless of genders, which is how we could define pansexual, but it is inclusive of more genders than just man and woman. And Mm -hmm. even as far back as the 1993 Bisexual Manifesto, there was an acknowledgement of attraction to other genders within a bisexual orientation label. So I would just like to... State that for the record for your listeners. I love it. And I will say Thank you. Yes. very early on episode, I'm going to take a wild stab at episode six with Bradford and Angela from the By the By podcast. We had a similar conversation with him about bisexuality. And I his answer was something to the effect of, for him, bisexuality means being attracted to, it was, it was, his gender and others. It was very, right. it was exactly what you said. And it was the first time that I had heard it voiced that way. And that was back in 2018. And so I just, as you were saying that, I was like, oh, I've had this conversation, but it's been a long time. Okay. So I love <laughs> it's, it. important. And it, it's important. It gets dropped a lot and, and it contributes to, to bi erasure and, and, mm-hmm internal yeah, yeah. inner community conflict uh between yeah. label choices and things like that yeah yeah i love it thank you for uh yeah sharing that part yeah so yeah. in terms of the work that i do um i have i have a lot of fingers and a lot of pies i uh i i guess lecture for um universities and graduate programs and um, community groups. I do workshops. I do a lot of uh, one individual and partners, couples and more um, peer-to-peer counseling work and coaching work and uh, sex and intimacy skills education work. I uh, love to do professional development training, you know, therapists and doctors and other helping professionals to work with queer folks, non-monogamous folks, kinky folks, they do not receive anywhere near adequate training on that. Uh, I love to do case consultation with folks. I run a, a newly formed uh, entrepreneur group called Body Business that is directed to entrepreneurs who are queer or kinky or sex positive or ethically non-monogamous and who also serve those communities. The business doesn't have to be oriented around that. It could be someone who's uh, a dentist who Mm -hmm. uh, is non-monogamous. And it's meant to, there are a lot of business groups that, that are very conservative or very, um, or you, or you can't really show up fully in, or you can't talk about the struggles of running your own business while also maintaining your partnerships with, you know, multiple romantic partners. And I find that we have to compartmentalize ourselves so much in our working lives. And particularly, you know, if you have a sole proprietorship or you sm- small business, if you're an entrepreneur, every piece of your life is impacted by running your own business. And so having a space where you can show up for peer support, where you can show up for resources, where you can show up for a little bit of networking with more of your total self 
I think is really healing and valuable. And so I created this group, which meets virtually monthly, typically on a, on Monday nights is what we're, what we're working with right now. But, uh, you know, that may change in the future, depending on how the group grows. That's my new, my new baby, my new pet project that I'm, uh, very excited for. Uh, and I also have a, I have a lot of client openings and I'm, I'm new to the Bay area. So I'm, I'm connecting with different schools and I'm connecting with different training programs. And, uh, if you, you know, if you, if you are someone who wants to bulk up your sex and intimacy and relationship skills, or who's dealing with a relationship transition, like opening up your relationship or, um, a partner's newly, newly discovered orientation, uh, that's, I'm absolutely someone who can, who can help you with that and resource you with that. I also work with families. Um, not, not that many families yet, but I really want to be working with more families who are navigating, um, maybe their child is gender queer and they don't know how to manage that or what that means or what that looks like, or they have concerns for that child's safety or how to manage that socially with the rest of the family. Um, that is, that's, that holds a really tender place for me as a genderqueer, um, child mm-hmm. of a family that I'm no longer a part of. Mm-hmm. And so, uh, that, that is something that I'm calling in more of, or, or folks who ha- have kids who are non-monogamous and navigating what that looks like as a parent, that's, you know, that's also something I really want to be working more with. So I'm, I'm sort of all over the map. I, f- I teach at retreats. If you're someone who mm-hmm. likes to go to retreats and you're like, wow, I'd really love to have a gender component there, you know, throw, throw me the way of the organizers. Okay. So those are some of the different pieces and, and parts. And I also am a big advocate of nature therapy and, um, somatic work and and i work in all of these different yummy juicy modalities that that i just love to chat with people about and i love to Mm -hmm. further the public understanding of Mm -hmm. uh so you can find out more information about that on my website it's phoenixmendel.com i do exist on some social media i'm working on uh being more present there but uh as i mentioned i'm an entrepreneur i work in a lot of different arenas there are many different polls uh, I definitely, I definitely still have a high, a fairly high degree of resentment for having to be a social media personality as well as being an educator, as well as being a mental health provider. Yeah. But I'm, you know, I do exist. I'm a, you know, I'm on, I'm on Twitter for a, however long it continues to live and I'm on Instagram and I'm on uh, Facebook uh, groups and, you know, all that yeah. kind of thing. <laughs> Love it. Love it. Well, thank you for everything for coming on for sharing for all of the work you do yeah yeah links to everything that you just mentioned will be in the show notes thank you is there anything else that you would like to mention before before we let you get on with your day i just want to want to leave people with that you have no idea what you're capable of things that are scary or seem like not a fit for the you that you are right now we are constantly changing and evolving and learning and growing and just consider if, if something that's maybe exciting, but also scary or maybe not exciting to you in this moment, but very exciting to someone important to you, just consider trying things on. You don't have to, it's not like if you dip your toe in the ethical non-monogamy pool, someone's going to shove you in. Hopefully not. Um, it's okay. It's okay to check things out and it's okay to experiment with your self concept and it's, and it's, and it's good for you to do so for whatever flavor that looks like for you. Um, and it's important to, to breathe into it and to, uh, let yourself have room to play. We are here in these bodies on this planet. Ultimately, I think to, 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 to savor and to sample and to, to connect deeply. And so just give your, give yourself that permission. This is me giving you that permission and encouraging you to, um, to do some experimentation in your day. Maybe that's trying a new flavor of latte, or maybe that's asking someone out who you uh, have been thinking about for a long time, but not feeling brave enough to, to try it with. We, as far as I know, we only have this one short life. So get after it. I love it. Thank you for leaving us there. That's beautifully said. And thank you for everything you shared today too. It's been a wonderful yeah. conversation. Yeah, it was amazing. Thank you, Phoenix. And 
yeah, go go live the rest of your amazingly short day, <laughs> and we will we'll, we will bump into you around the Bay Area here. And excellent, excellent. <laughs> And we're back. Thank you so much, Phoenix, for coming on the podcast, sharing your amazing story, and for all of the work that you do. We're so grateful. And a quick reminder to all you listeners, go to our show notes at normalizingnonmonogamy.com, and you can find links to all of Phoenix's work, including how to sign up for their body business meeting. The next one is on April 25th. Yeah, a huge thank you, Phoenix, for coming on and for being a part of our community and just for being a part of the greater community and life. Yes. It's amazing. Very much so. A couple of other quick reminders. The first big one that we want to make sure everybody is super duper aware of, our virtual meet and greet, which was originally going to be on April 21st, has moved a week and a day later to April 29th. Anyway, we would still love to have you join us. It is now on a Saturday night, which is really the best night to party. Uh, yeah. I think. Yeah. So we will be partying it up on April 29th. We would love for you to join us, and we'll see you then. Also, a quick reminder, we will be at Southwest Love Fest April 14th to the 16th in Tucson, Arizona. Links to find out more are in the show notes. And if you sign up, you can use the offer code EMMA to get 10% off. You know what's cool about that conference is one of the nights is a Saturday night, and that's the night to party. There is a party. So I'll probably be partying. There's a dance party that night. There's a dance party. I better bring my dance (laughs) shoes. Okay, next week we have an interview. Ain't ain't never seen anybody dance till you've seen Finn dance. (laughs) You're trying to hook him in? Yeah. I I think it's worth your your admission. I was going to call it tuition. (laughs) It's worth your admission just to come and watch me dance. (laughs) I'd second that. You do? Yeah, it's amazing. It's something. You're a wonderful dancer. It's something. I once... Here's a fun story for people. (laughs) Way off track. Yeah, way off track. But, you know, it's the outro. We can do whatever. (laughs) One time we were dancing. We were at a club. One of the few times we've ever gone to, like, a club that wasn't, okay. you know, a club. So we were at the club. Downstairs is a piano bar. We're upstairs dancing. And this woman, we're dancing. And then she reaches around and grabs my ass... This was like just a, a regular club. I know. It was just a regular old... We were above a piano. Like, this yes. was... Right. Never she, met this person before. We danced for like one or two songs. She got done dancing and she reaches behind and grabs my ass with both hands and goes, you got a great ass. <laughs> and then she walked off the dance floor. <laughs> so... Best night of your life. I mean, you know, I should have been offended. But I was like, hell, you know... <laughs> I'll take it. I don't get that every day. I could see how if I got that every day, it would get a little tiring. But, you know, once every 35 years, I'm okay with. (laughs) Anyway, (laughs) next week we have, not to just like skim over your story, I'm just trying to. I just want to say I'm guessing the crowd at Southwest Love Fest is a lot more consent forward Uh than than the random like 23-year-old woman who grabbed my ass. This, I was was also about that age. This wasn't 23, anyway. Uh, Oh my gosh, (laughs) trying to add all these caveats. Well, I don't know. I just have never had my ass grabbed like that. So So there was consent missing is what you should say. and Which which is like, there's a little bit of shame of like, why did I like it so much? (laughs) (laughs) Because attention can be fun. Yeah. Depending. I I suppose if it, like I said, if it was every day, I'd probably get a little weary of it. Okay. Anyway, we're going down rabbit holes here like crazy. The point is, you should come dance at Southwest Love Fest. I will not grab your ass. In Tucson, Arizona. And if you want to grab mine, you can ask. Yes. That's what I would say. (laughs) Got it. And I have it on good authority that it's a good ass. (laughs) It is a good ass. Anyway, next week. I bet you're glad you stuck around. (laughs) What's next week? (laughs) I've tried to say it like four times. (laughs) Next week, we have an interview with Alyssa. Which is amazing and beautiful. Yeah, it's a wonderful conversation. And in the meantime, if you want, you can definitely go. I recommend going and checking out Alyssa's book, which came out a few months ago and is called Non-Monogamy and Neurodiversity, A More Than Two Essentials Guide. And we are stoked about it. Yes. Come back and listen. I don't know if you got the message, Emma, but there's a bit of overlap uh, in the non-monogamy community with the neurodivergent community. Yes, there is. It's it's almost a perfect circle. <laughs> there is a lot of overlap. So we're super excited about Alyssa's book. And, and the conversation. And the conversation and just can't wait to promote it. Yeah. So we'll see you all next week for that amazing conversation. We expect you have read the book by then. <laughs> and then we'll see you for some ass grabbing dancing at, at Southwest, Southwest Love Fest. Fest. <laughs> all right. There you go. 
Anyway, bye everyone. Thanks for listening.